We're here with Dirk Ulrich, um, yeah. who yeah. is the who is the founder of Brainworks. Is that correct? And Brainworks and Plugin Lens, really. Uh, yeah. Brainworks was first. That was actually founded in 1999, uh, initially as a production company, and then we made recordings with bands and all kinds of stuff. And then that turned into creating the first plugins uh, out of basically necessity that there was an MS EQ that I wanted to make. And um, yeah, and after then we started working with other companies once we had a program and all that stuff going. Uh, we signed up SPL first and then Elysia. And after a few years, I think in 2012, we actually founded and went live with the Plugin Lines website just to have these different brands on one website. And that actually, um, accelerated uh, the growth of the company because now with all these brands on one website and all, one unified uh, system that really um, kick, kicked off well. Oh, fantastic. Um, uh, well, I guess the first thing I will say from our end is your, <coughs> um, your expansion of the demo plan kind of uh, gave us a really great way to adjust to the fact that it, um, at the University of West London, we have um, 18 or 19 studios there, all with large, like with, <coughs> I think it's like 10 or 12 large format consoles. So a lot of our students uh, were expecting at this point to move into large format consoles. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, basically the, the BX designs in particular in the, the console channel strips and the TMT um, meant that we were able to switch without mm -hmm. kind of feeling like the students had lost anything. So thank you for operating very quickly on that. Was, was, there, was there a reason? Did you just sort of go, right, we've got to do something? Yeah, we saw a lot of people on Facebook and social media in general and um, complain about the fact that they, that they all have issues now continuing their work. And <clears throat> we actually thought, okay, what can we do besides sending out some voucher codes and making it more affordable maybe these days to... to buy a few plugins, but how can we actually get a few people to, to use all of our plugins again and extend that demo period? The only way we could do it was really to extend it to 30 days and the plugins, even when you activate them right now, they still save 14 days because it's built into the license, into the plugins. We would have to do a, a complete uh, new launch of all the plugins and that's something we can't do, but internally it will actually kick off a 30 day license now. And we also deleted all the previous demos. so people can actually demo stuff again, even if they had demos in the past. And that's uh, that's what we try to do. Um, thank you for this. You're, you're one of the first um, universities that I've been in contact with where I actually hear a, a feedback and, and see that it actually helps. I'm, I'm happy to hear this. And one thing that's, uh, that's really cool and worth mentioning is that um, actually yesterday, after several years of working on this, I received an email from the US that our TMT patent actually just got issued. So uh, we started this several years ago. And now that wow. you mentioned TMT, as of yesterday, I hear uh, that this patent finally has gone through. And it was the first patent that I've ever worked on. So I don't, maybe you're even more familiar with it working in the university and maybe hear about that uh, kind of stuff more often. But for me, it was quite the process to go back and forth with patent lawyers and then the authorities and yeah but ultimately we, we got that patent congratulations that's amazing um and yes yeah um and you know american the american legal <clears throat> system and going between lawyers in the states is a probably a very different process to the uk with with the barristers here as well so um that sounds like it was a it was a huge effort yeah it's, i mean just like w with so many authorities it's you get a reply from them and then you you reply to their reply and then you wait for three months or six months right and then after six months you get something back again and you have to react again so it was a process of several years so when did we launch the first consoles maybe four years ago or so so actually this has been in the making for literally quite a few years but we haven't been working on it constantly of course it's uh, yeah. yeah yeah so with the tmt <clears throat> When did the idea come up and what, why did you suddenly go, oh, that's right, everyone's just copying the same plugin and, mm -hmm. and wondering why everything sounds so narrow? Well, so have you seen pictures of our studio in Germany? We, we actually own a 72-channel Neve console and some big PMC speakers, and, and so we have a really nice setup there. And when we 
had the idea of uh, finally, we were pretty late to the game really with modeling a console. We, we decided, okay, let's start with our own console because we, we have this thing in our studio and um, we can work with it and compare easily. And so we knew that we were really good at already at that time with modeling EQs and compression and all that stuff. And so when we compared that one channel, our golden channel that we picked basically to model the console, this was spot on like, like uh, most or all of our emulations really. But then I'm sitting on that desk. Um, I, I can try and show you from a picture. I don't know if you can see this, but do you see oh, the, yeah, little, yeah. the little mouse pad here? So yep. when I work, even when I work just in the door, I sit at that console and um, so I was doing a test mix with that new plugin and I spoke to the developers and said, look, I know that one channel is spot on, but when I do a full mix, it still doesn't sound exactly as if I was mixing on that console. And then we, we investigated a little bit and one idea that came up early was, well, if you have two channels and you're trying to EQ and compress a stereo channel for some doubled guitar tracks or stereo sample, piano, overheads or whatever, it's really hard to EQ them exactly uh, equally, right? Mm. So we did some tests and we even tried to EQ two channels uh, the, the same and we ended, then we did some measurements and we ended up with very different curves and then at some point, I had this idea that um, the console, even in a linked mode, still has some more life to the dynamics, for example. And that's because we, we figured out then at some point that it's because of the tolerances of the components in these channels. And I had the developers take a look at this. and They figured out, I think it was around 150 individual components that actually have an influence on the sound. So we, we ignored the parts that maybe make the lights go on and off and maybe one light is a little bit brighter or darker than the other one that doesn't affect the sound of course but everything that affects noise center frequencies attack and release times and dynamics gates compressors whatever um, those parts we we concentrated on <clears throat> and then we came up with this idea of implementing or including these realistic tolerances into our model and then our guys actually spent a couple of weeks on researching every single component in that console. They're, they're all labeled, right? And you can find out from the manufacturer websites or, or catalogs if these parts are stated uh, with a tolerance of 1% or 2%, some are 10 or even 20%. So you can't just apply 20% to every single part in the console because that would give you a very unrealistic uh, behavior and you can't do everything with one percent either because then it would just not be enough tolerances in some uh, parts and so after a few weeks of working on this we had a model that um, i think that's probably a first for for plugins also where you had uh, 72 different channels in this one plugin that you can select and where you have slightly different left and right channels also mm -hmm. when you use a stereo channel even though you have one control, um, just like with most stereo plugins. But like I said, even if you have a linked compressor in the TMT consoles, they, the attack and release times will behave slightly different on the left and right channels. And we, ever since we released these plugins, we've spoken to lots of uh, users. They actually tell us that just like in the real world, people pick their favorite channel pair now. They say, well, my drum bus goes through channel 21 22 because i like how the how that compressor um, combination really reacts on my on my signal or i'm using whatever 37 for my vocal uh, for my lead vocal um, because i like this channel a lot and while the differences are not day and night of course it's not like having different consoles we we did some shootout against uh, real consoles there's a video of me um doing a demo against the real SSL console, for example, at Fantasy Studios in Berkeley. And that's a <clears throat> very famous studio mm -hmm. where Journey and um, lots of other big acts uh, have recorded. And that console was up to specs and, and um, had gone to service recently, they even told me. And we brought up eight faders of that console and we showed with um, analyzers that these that these channels were not exactly the same when you boost frequencies to the maximum and, and um, center frequencies were off, the maximum and minimum gains were off slightly. And one impressive video that I saw from a user actually was on YouTube as well. There was a guy who routed a mono bass drum to a stereo uh, bus and that bus contained the, um, the BX console plugin. 
And he showed that if you have it in digital mode where you have two identical channels, one and one, for example, two and two, um, and that's just like how every other waves and UAD and soft tube plugin is, they, they all have the same channel, right? Then um, the compression kicks in and you see on your scope that it's like a really thin line. It's, it's completely mono, of course, and it reacts uh, simultaneously. Now, if you apply the digital mode, then you see how the attack and release times are slightly different on left and right. For example, the compressor may duck the signal a little bit faster on the left channel and then release it faster on the right channel. So the, this uh, little analyzer started bouncing around and that was really interesting to see because it shows some kind of, um, how do you say, li liveliness or live? Li uh, yeah, liveliness, yeah. Yeah, yeah li liveliness that maybe you don't, uh, it's more static if, you, if you're using that digital mode. And I thought to myself, well, that's, that's a really cool presentation. And you can only imagine if you're applying this to, let's say, 40 or 50 tracks in a, in a session, maybe even stereo channels that start to bounce a little bit, that just brings mixes more to life. Um, and then mm. <clears throat> ultimately, of course, we know that the tolerances cause some really small phase issues. It's almost like applying mid-side stereo with uh, frequency uh, depending, right? If you cue and then, then the, the 3K are a little bit more boosted on one channel than on the other channel that creates really small phase issues. And those are the, the type of issues that just sound pleasant to the human ear, I guess. And uh, yeah. a lot of pro users that have worked on big consoles for some of them for decades, have sent us emails and talked to us at conventions and actually said that these type of the, T the TMT console line is basically the most realistic representation of an analog console that they have heard in the box. And that's, of course, something that, that we're very happy about. And yeah, that, that's something I would agree with <coughs> as well. The, um, I'm a big fan of the, the, uh, the roulette style of clicking the all button mm -hmm. until I'm yeah. happy. I just click it and then I go, oh, that one, that, that everything sits the way I kind of like it in that one. I, I do the same thing when, when I when I give a um, I, I I'm old school. I mean, I'm 48, turning 49 uh, this month, actually in April now. And um, I started working on consoles, and I, of course, I don't work on that big Neve console that we have in our studio every day anymore because I'm not producing music on a daily basis anymore. We still have it there as our reference, and it's also it's like our museum. We have this whole rack with our we call it the the uh, wall of fame, all the units that we modeled, but. Um, there's there's something to it uh, for sure and um yeah yeah which which brings me to the other thing is now you you're someone who's produced bands um broilers in 2015 would probably be mm -hmm. the most recent one i could find evidence of um mm -hmm. so um and then it was crimson Ghost. They, they, they're huge in germany now i produced all of their albums for the first 11 years and then it was almost that, that we're still friendly I, i'm still friends with the guys um the, the, while my software company was starting to, to form and to take mm. off and I didn't have the time anymore to spend two or three months in the studio with, with a single band um, all the time, they also got signed by Universal um, and um, they're huge now. They're filling the biggest hall, halls and theaters in Germany. They're playing 20,000 seat shows on their own and, and playing big festivals in the summertime. Um, wow. So yeah, they, they, they took off. I, I produced all of their early stuff and then at some point we we decided mutually almost like yeah you would be silly i told them if you don't take that universal deal which also came of course with yeah then you have to work with our producer and then i mean they had some good guys uh, working with, with their bands of course mm. so it wasn't wasn't a negative thing at all and um, i knew i couldn't be involved anymore but at the same time i also just didn't have the time anymore so it was good do you miss being in the room with the, uh, with the yeah musicians? Once, once in a while so i we, we have uh, two guys in our company, actually, that uh, make music on a professional level. We have uh, Andre, who's um, working as a DJ under the um, name of Loxley. And he's flying to Australia and to California for weekends and to play shows. And he's producing a lot of his own music. And we produce uh, some of his music together. I master some of his tracks sometimes uh, with him in that studio. And then we have Christoph, our product manager for most of the consoles and guitar and plugins, all the rock and roll stuff. And he plays guitar in a band, um, they're called Tri-State Corner. And they are signed to a professional label. They, they've been playing tours as support acts for, for bigger acts and also play on a lot of festivals. 
and we actually mixed their second last album on that Neve console. We decided to not do it in the box, but actually use the console and, and uh, hook up all the outboard equipment. Took us way longer than probably would have uh, taken us in the box, but it was fun. And yeah, I, I love that console for sure. I mean, even though I love plugins, there's something to having all these knobs in front of you. There's a smell to a console when it gets warm and it's, it's just an experience, so. And there's a there's a physicality and a movement to it as well that I because that that's one of the things that I like I I've been thinking for a long time that the sound is closer and closer, but the um but the physical movement of of clicking a mouse for me mm -hmm. at the moment in a in a tiny apartment in London um, is I miss the movement I miss the getting up and grabbing things and playing around. Oh. Yeah, that that's true. And and one thing that I think a lot of people overlook when they when they compare the sound of a plugin to these consoles is, I mean, if you've probably been to a lot of studios yourself that have consoles like this, maybe you even have some in your university, and you've been maybe to to other studios. So, literally every room that I've been to that hosts the big SSL or me for API console is typically acoustically treated and it has decent speakers and it has a really nice position. So I, this is the experience that I had when we, um, when we modeled our console. At first I wasn't um, uh, happy because it was not the same as working with the console really while I was sitting at the same spot that I usually uh, am sitting at when I'm working on that console. But after we um, implemented that TMT thing, now I can really produce mixes that are more or less identical. I mean, I, it's it, to me, it's not about like, do we completely face cancel a whole mix or whatever, but it's the same workflow. And ultimately, if, if you want a little bit more presence on that signal, you just turn the knob a little bit more to the right and then or you apply a little bit more compression and, and that's it, so whatever you like. But so that, to me, when sometimes people say, well, this doesn't sound like a real console. And then as you said, you're sitting maybe in a, some people mix with headphones and they're, when they go to a big studio, all of a sudden they sit in this big room that's maybe 80 square meters, you know, and has huge speakers and acoustical, uh, acoustical treatment. Mm. So I think that has to be taken into account. And um, whenever we do demos in studios, for example, I did a demo to some VIP producers and, and some mastering engineers a few months ago at Sphere Studios in Los Angeles, and that's a huge studio. They have the, the biggest PMCs, the BB-5 or whatever they're called, and Bryson Power Amps, and the room was designed by some famous studio designer. I mean, when you put your session up on that computer and it's, uh, it's, an, uh, it's a console emulation, it sounds very close to what you would do in that room with the real console. And that's, that's proof for me that, that these things work. Yeah, I'm also a bit of a PMC fan. I'm just buying a set of 225s off um mm -hmm. off chris at the moment so we're uh yeah, yeah but by the way i i hope it's okay to men i mean i will mention brand names not to, I'm, I'm not endorsed by pmc or ssl or neve but i i actually like their stuff and i bought their stuff and i paid for that stuff and so um i think when we when we geek out over gear you probably have to mention a few brand names uh, I... otherwise it wouldn't make any sense if i always just refer to a speaker and a console or and that then, British yeah. console or uh, <laughs> which British console yeah right uh, there's yeah. a few right um the no no that that that's amazing um that no I this, it's the same for me I I don't have any um endorsement or anything like that I prefer to prefer to use what I like to use um and then and obviously we work with a lot of companies and for example SSL is actually one of them we have a contract mm. uh, an agreement with SSL but they also know that I still have my studio that has a Neve console and, and we don't have a, a deal with Neve. So, um, but I think that's, that's how it is. And yeah, we, we do have uh, agreements with all these other outboard companies like SPL and Elysian Millennia and whatever. But if, if I find a piece of gear for my own use that I just love, even though I'm not associated, associated with that company, I will use it. I think it's uh, most companies in that space are also really small. So in a way, if you buy a compressor or AEQ, it's still also supporting somebody who's passionate about what they're doing. I mean, most of these companies are not as big as Apple and Sony, and, and so there's sometimes three guys or five guys, you know, running really small businesses. 
And I also tend to find that there's a, um, to me, you know, if you think of a company as a human, it's uh, if you talk about other companies and they get self-conscious about it, then that's a, it's, it's, it's a little bit, oh, I thought you were more confident than that. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. Um, but you bring up an interesting point here. You work with a lot of companies and you work with a lot of things, but you also build completely one-off analog pieces and then model those. That's actually, so that's an interesting story because we do have as Brainworks, we have an agreement and, and plug-in alliance, Brainworks and plug-in alliance, uh, an agreement with Elysia and we have modeled all their um, existing hardware units, the ones that you can actually buy and, and order from them. And then they had this idea and that's actually a third party product. So um, that's those guys working with their own programmer and, and this was a freaky project, uh, um, so to speak, in, in a positive way, I mean this. And um, so that's something that I actually have not been a part of for creating it. I mean, yes, I've signed this product ultimately and I've, I've given them my recommendations and I've tested it when it was uh, in, in alpha stage, but that was their thing. And I really thought it was a, a really cool idea and neat project. Um, in a way, I mean, Brainworks and Plugin Lines, we're now getting closer to 40 employees. So in a way, we've become really mainstream and then we can't just uh, spend several months on, on trying something out. If we, um, we're more focused, like right now, for example, we're releasing next week, we're releasing a new SSL 9000J console. And that's, and, some, and that's something that has never been modeled. So that, mm. that for us is kind of a mainstream product. We know that's going to sell. We put a lot of work and a lot of time into creating this and, and so even working with SSL on making sure it's accurate. We've worked with Michael Brower in New York to make sure that it, me, uh, that it actually sounds like his desk and, and all these things. And then if somebody comes up with an idea like the Elysia um, uh, one-off uh, box, that's something at this point we probably uh, wouldn't do at the Brainworks headquarter. But they said, well, we have a guy and we, we could build that hardware with this guy. And then we also have another guy and, and he would actually do the programming. And I said, great, it's, it's a great concept. Let's try it. And it was actually very successful for them because I think a lot of people like that approach of building something specifically to model it and then to make a plugin out of it. That's, that's because they were able now to use all these parts that in theory you couldn't even sell anymore, even for legal reasons. I mean, all these row HS compliancy mm. issues that yep, you yep. have, if there's a lead or any, uh, I, I'm not an expert with this, but there are materials in these units. First of all, you can't get them in big numbers, all these rare tubes and whatever they put into this uh, thing. And then some materials that you wouldn't be allowed to sell uh, commercially. So I thought it was a genius idea to build one thing and then model it. And so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's very cool. I, I like the idea that you kind of all, almost with the we're talking about the Phil's Cascade um, mm -hmm. that you get around the inevitable comparison versus the hardware unit as well. That everyone goes, oh, my hardware unit sounds better or something like that. You, there, there is no hardware unit. It's but 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 this thing really went away. I have to say, a couple of years ago, and partly also with this TMT. I mean, people realize now that mm. by setting uh, this the a console for example to a certain setting and then just clicking through different channels of the same board it will sound slightly different it will have a little bit more high end or low end or more compression less compression um so if we model for example we've modeled the spl vitalizer and we um th that's a box that was 25 years old when we modeled it i think it's more than 30 years old at this point Mm. And SPL gave us a, a unit to, uh, and said, this is the model we want you, to, uh, the, the unit we want you to model. And then we, when we were done with it, we had a listening session with Herman, one of the co-founders and uh, owners of SPL. They, they're pretty close. They're like less than an hour by car away from uh, the Leverkusen Brainworks office. And then we were sitting there and listening to the plugin and the hardware. And he said, well, you know, I think... I think my unit that I have uh, in my studio sounds slightly different. Can we make another appointment and I bring my uh, personally uh, owned unit? And I said, sure, we can do this. And then we 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 compared the two hardware units and it turned out that he had one of the earliest units, obviously when they built this thing and tested it, he took one home to his studio and it kept it, he kept it there ever since then. And it turned out that they had to replace the 
the, the knobs and switches um, over time because th these, I think it was 270 degree switches in, in the old version. And then they had to switch to 300 degrees knobs uh, at some point because those knobs just were not available anymore. Um, they weren't made anymore. And so we saw that there was small difference between these two hardware units. And then we asked him, well, we have to decide which unit do you want us to model? And he said, you know what, then let's model my unit. And we'll even put that in the marketing text that it's modeled after Herman's uh, privately owned uh, unit. Mm -hmm. And so we did that and our developer measured a few things and there were small differences between these uh, circuits and there were 25 years between these two hardware boxes when they were made. So I think when people compare any EQ or compressor that we've made, and even if they own one of these, there's a fair chance that it will be closed, but not face canceling because they have a different unit. And when we talk about dynamics also, that's an interesting point maybe worth mentioning. So we, we typically get filters and EQs to face cancel with the hardware that we model. But when you're talking about dynamics, um, then obviously there's time curves and everything involved. It's much harder to actually face cancel a dynamic curve of something. And it even has something to do with the um, converters that you're using. Because if, if we, we have a set of converters that we always use at Brainworks, it used to be the old Digi 96 IOs that was our standard for many years. And I'm, I'm not even sure which ones the guys are using right now, but they have a certain input and output level and we we measured many uh, converters they they differ as well i mean not every converter outputs exactly the same analog level so when you compare a compressor and then you you send a, a snare drum to an analog compressor and through a plug-in it's very possible that if you have the knob set to let's say 12 o'clock the hardware compresses a little bit more or less than the plugin because of the different uh, input and output uh, levels. Mm. But what you really have to do when you compare those is adjust the compressor so it um, maybe has 3 dB of gain reduction and then you match that on your analog unit and turn the knob to where it also has 3 dB of gain reduction. Then these two units, the, the plugin and the hardware, should sound really, really close but not necessarily um, when you set both knobs to 12 o'clock when it's about the threshold. So, yeah. On, yeah and on the cues, we actually match the knob behavior. So if it's, we, it's, we, we used to just um, match an EQ by setting it to the maximum value, let's say plus 10 dB, and then you match the curve and then the rest uh, between zero and the maximum was just linear. Then we found out over time that actually a lot of knobs don't behave linear. So now we take at least, I think, eight or 10 positions of the knob and we match every position and then only interpolate between these uh, these threshold levels, so uh -huh. to speak. Or the, so this the, we found that out on the Mac EQ4, actually. Um, Dave Righteous, who's the producer for Madonna and Celine Dion and a lot of these, mm. uh, he, a lot of these uh, lady lady singers, um, he said that he um, remembered that when he's working on his hardware EQ2, there's a bit, there's a, a, almost like a switch between 2 dB plus and 2.5 because it's a step pot. Mm. And so it does click, click, click. And then there's this quick, bigger jump in value from 2 to 2.5. And when we sent him this uh, plugin to test, he said, well, it's missing that behavior. And then we measured, and so we actually decided, okay, it's a step thing, so let's actually model each and every step of the knob. And then the same goes for guitar amps. They're not linear. When you have a gain knob on a guitar amp, you can't just model the maximum and then make everything else linear in between. It would, you could still get every second, uh, every, every setting this way, but it would feel very unnatural for a guitar player to turn a, a linear gain knob on a, on a distorted amp. It, it, you know, as, as a guitarist, sometimes I might actually find that satisfying because um, <laughs> sometimes it's frustrating. <laughs> um, I know you have to, the, the, the setting you like is between 3.25 and 3.4, right? And it's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then the next, and then once you hit the four, it's at full volume. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, no, that that's great. Yeah, I've noticed you've also picked up a couple of... Um, uh, much smaller companies like uh, my friend Brad McGowan from Louder Than Liftoff mm -hmm. as well. So he'd been doing... Oh, you, you know him? Okay, that's cool. Yeah, I own a Silver Bullet. So I, mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, I've been friends with Brad for a little while, yes. But we actually got in 
in contact with him through the guys from uh, back, uh, Russ, he, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Hughes or Hutches from uh, Pro Tools Expert or these expert mm. uh, Facebook pages. And he was working with, um, uh, with, with a guy from Louder Than Liftoff. And so he proposed this and it was a neat uh, little 500 module and he was developing him, uh, it himself. So we said, yeah, let's, yeah. let's do this. Yeah, I mean, when, when you look at our catalog, actually, with the plugin alliance, it it differs a little bit from the from the catalog of, of waves and universal audio, maybe because they started all with the classics. They all did the 1176s and LA 2As and all these uh, really old things when they started. And I think now they're, of course, I mean, since they want to produce more stuff over time, they're looking for for other product now. But we never started this way. When when I started with Brainworks, the first thing we did was this MSEQ, the BX Digital, mm -hmm. and then I was fascinated by the by the idea that we could actually model what um, once we found this guy, um, whatever we we find really. And so I was focusing on gear that I thought was except, exceptional at that time. So we signed the Elysia Alpha compressor and the Vertigo VSC2. Those were not classic pieces at that time. Um, but I thought they were actually way superior over some, some. I'm not saying about above everything, but above some of the old vintage things that that you find everywhere. And I thought also we have a limited bandwidth. I know with one developer at that time, I can't make 50 plugins a year, of course. So um, let's choose wisely and make some plugins that are not already even 15 years ago. I mean, LA2A was already out. I don't know from five or six different companies, I guess. So why? Why would my first plugin have been an, mm. another LA two A right at that point? And what's yeah. funny is that even over time now people keep asking for these classics. So we we have signed Purple Audio now to have an eleven seventy six sound in our arsenal. I have views uh, on that. Um, the so your Purple Audio eleven seventy six, I think sounds better than any purple audio hardware i'm australian so um there's a lot of them in australia mm -hmm. um and i don't want to uh, i don't want to insult anyone but i think your plugin of it sounds better than any hardware i've ever used now that might just be that the that the units i've used probably need servicing and it that's come to, that's come to my mind because i always every purple audio i ever used i was always going oh it's not really an 11 it doesn't feel like an 1176 to me but with yours I immediately loved it, and it's the first okay. time I've ever liked the plugin more than the hardware, which is an that's, that's, interesting. That's interesting. It could be related to again what I just talked about the the levels. Maybe when you have a hardware unit and you run something through it, maybe you have to set it differently, and maybe the plugin feels more I don't know more direct or whatever with the way it reacts to the signal. It could also be most companies when they when they uh, decide to work with us and we sign an agreement and then at some point they send us the hardware, they actually do a shootout um, and they call it their golden unit. For example, mm. Shadow Hits, uh, Peter Reardon told us that he went through 15 different uh, Shadow Hits mastering compressors, I guess, and then decided to send us the one that was the closest to his golden unit that he uses as a reference to match yep. all the other ones against. And th this is, for example, a unit that uh, differs quite a lot because of the opto compressor parts in there that are just not, they have pretty high tolerances. So mm -hmm. he's matching them by ear and by, by, by tweaking them, I guess, but uh, it's just not every unit sounds the same. And so maybe we were just lucky to receive a really good uh, sounding unit um, for the purple, I... and that's possible. Some of, the, some of the places that I've been in, I would also be inclined to say that they were due for a service as mm -hmm. well so but then that's not necessarily a bad thing sometimes something that's due for a service sounds special yeah. i had an la2a the, the, that was, the one thing that's cool of course with the plugins is that we the first few years we we modeled them pretty religiously just like the hardware or the old spl and, and whatever and then at some point we actually started enhancing plugins when we saw something that the plugin should have uh, because it's easy to do like we started with dry wet controls and compressors mm. that didn't have them in, in analog and it's actually not trivial in the analog world i was told by people at spl to make a really good dry wet control in an analog box because mm. of phasing issues Whereas in the plugin, it's really pretty straightforward. I mean, you blend between the original and between 
this and because everything is phase aligned and, and so it's, it's pretty pretty easy. Then of course the TMT and then um, in some of the consoles we added uh, times three or divided by three for the frequency range of the high pass and low pass filters. We added the Neve uh, console actually has an internal second threshold, um, so you can actually avoid pumping this way, and it, it has mm. that internally. We decided to add that kind of functionality to SSL uh, compressors that don't have that in real life. So you could argue that the plugin compressor in these channel uh, emulations is actually more flexible than the real thing. And or the mono make and stereo width that we have in a lot of uh, stereo compressors with the TMT. I mean, that's we enjoy this and we see users reacting positively to it. So mm -hmm. People tell us uh, that they actually like these enhancements, and I think the 1176 is the same. There's a few uh, things that Christoph, our product manager, built into this thing that the hardware just doesn't have, and um, yeah, so it's yeah, it's it's like the hardware great. with. Because I've always uh, had a theory that there are things that digital does really well and there are things that analog does really well. And what I love yeah. to see, so one of my favorite EQs of all time is is the um, the BX Digital V3 at the moment. Okay. Um, it's It does a thing that I can't achieve in the analog world. I did see one, one day when I was just surfing around board or something, I did see something that looked like a hardware version of it. And then yes. I'll... There's one. There's actually two. Let me show you. What? I'm. There's. Um, I'm. I'm working from home right now, like everybody. But this is actually another uh, uh, um, prototype no. that we built. I, I can't. No, I can't get this out here right now. I think. Let me see. I, can you see a little bit? Yep. Yep. I've got it. No, I can see it. Uh, I don't think I can get the screw out here easily. Let's see. So then I could show you a bit better. It's a hand-wired uh, prototype of the BX1. The, ho the whole reason why this, um, why the BX Digital plugin um, came to life, C can you see this? <gasps> wow, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty small circuit board, yep. Yeah, nice. now the, I'm, I'm on, a, on a Skype interview here, Marina. I'm mm -hmm. coming upstairs in a second. Oops, that's my wife. <laughs> here, do you Hello. want to be in the video? Hi. Hi, nice to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the whole plugin thing started when I was producing music I went like I, I think I said this in the beginning uh, I went to a mastering studio and they had this MS setup and I couldn't afford to to just buy a Massenburg EQ and, and an external MS matrix so I asked a friend to build me one, one EQ an analog EQ that has the MS switches and all that stuff in there and um, while we were starting to do this, I talked to another friend who worked at Creamware, which uh, was a German company I making remember. interface. Yeah, okay. Mm. And they said, well, you have our interface and we can actually unlock a little software development kit that's already on the boards. It's just not unlocked for every customer, but it's a development kit. And then you can build your own little plugin with it, almost like a reactor. We have filters in there and all kinds of... Uh, circuits and you can put something together in this uh, system and you can experiment with the circuit before you actually commit to buying a housing and power supplies and switches i mean in, in the analog world even these the pots and the switches are so expensive i think that that prototype was three thousand euros in parts or something mm. crazy right um, especially when at that time i was producing metal and punk bands and really working on a budget so I couldn't have just bought a Massenburg EQ and an external MS matrix for 20,000 euros and I'd be broke. So during that work, the guy calls me back a few weeks later and says, hey, um, how, how are you getting along with that, uh, with that experiment that you wanted to do this uh, MS EQ circuit? And I sent him my little session that I was creating. And literally within 30 minutes, he calls me back and says, I spoke to my boss. Um, why don't you make a plugin out of this thing? It's amazing what you can do with it. And I said, well, because I don't know how to make plugins really. And he said, well, we can help you. So if you have somebody that could design a GUI that looks like whatever you want that EQ to look like, then we can turn whatever you've created here into a commercially available plugin. And I agreed to that. And so we modeled this uh, GUI basically after the prototype EQ that we were working on. 
And to be uh, fair, both of, we have two prototypes of this analog thing and both have small flaws that never got really worked out. The, um, I worked with two different designers and they weren't able to completely get everything going uh, that's inside because it's a very complicated circuit. The, the original EQ idea was that it's actually a three channel EQ because mm. um, it's labeled mono and stereo and there were it's called the modus EQ also because we had different modes in it. One mode would be the left and right, which is standard. And then there would be an M and S mode for mastering where you have a stereo signal hitting the EQ and then it gets converted to mid and side, you process and you convert it back. Then there was an MS recording mode where you hit it with MS microphones and uh, just convert it to stereo afterwards. And then there was actually a three channel uh, version or the three channel mode that has the left side operating on one channel and then the right uh, side of the, um, the EQ working on two channels simultaneously. So the EQ had three inputs, three outputs, uh, inserts, pre and post EQ. I mean, the back of this EQ looks like holes and holes and holes of XLRs. Mm. Um, I've even shown this to George Massenburg at, at a convention back in the days. And, and he asked me whether or not he could keep my printed out PDF uh, brochure that I had because he was so intrigued by the whole idea. And I said, oh, that's, that's an idea I want to keep for myself. But uh, it's just so complicated. And then really this, uh, this Screamware plugin that we built um, almost, almost by accident, um, this was what started Brainworks. These guys asked me later, they said, well, your English is fine and we're going to the NAMM show in Anaheim in California. Do you want to join us? We'd pay for your flight and your hotel. We won't pay you for your time, but you can demo your own plugin and you can see the NAMM show. And I said, okay, I'm in. And on that show, there was somebody from DigiDesign, uh, uh, Avid today, but back then they were DigiDesign. They were, um, he was uh, walking through the show and, and saw our little plugin and he said, hey, can we have this for Pro Tools? And that was basically the start of my little uh, career here. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it seems to have gone relatively well for you. <laughs> I mean, the last few years, I'm, act I'm, I'm very happy and very grateful about all of this. We've, yeah, we, we've reached a level with, with uh, plug and lens and brainworks that I wouldn't have thought was possible just a few years ago, really. I mean, like I said, we're, we're close to 40 employees now. I think we've, we've exceeded 500,000 user accounts at this point. We're selling and renting out mm -hmm. software to people around the globe, really, and we're part of so many professional productions, but also people just playing guitar in their bedroom. And I think it's, it's amazing. It's and still really creating cool. unique tools as well, which is in, in a saturated digital environment to still be creating unique tools is what, is what I find quite fascinating about this. It's, it's true. I mean, when we started, we, we just naturally uh, had this idea for the first MS EQ, right? And then we did a few more plugins, all based on this MS technology, because I, I got excited about the possibilities, really, of MS. And it was relatively easy at that time. First of all, we're talking 15 years ago, and there weren't all these plugins out yet that are out now. And not all the ideas had been uh, brought to life yet. Um, and now, in a way, we, we have to get creative. Like I said, if, if we just released another EQ and another compressor, and maybe even another copy of what's already out there from other companies, that's just not good enough. Uh, obviously, you can't just decide that you want to invent something as, uh, as unique as maybe Melodyne or so. I mean, Melodyne is actually one of the, the plugins uh, that I really adore. That's such a unique approach to, and, and to what they've done when, when it came out, especially when it was the the, um, the multi-voice version where you where they had demos of a guitar uh, playing and a piano and they changed the melody melody of the guitar but the piano keeps on playing what it used to play before from a stereo track that's that's pretty impressive but yeah we, we we've uh, we have some good guys in the company almost everybody in our company including the developers even are musicians not everybody is a professional some people just like to play some drums in their free time and some people are actually touring the world like like our guy Andre and, and uh, Christoph with his band and, and just uh, Andrew with his DJ um, business 
So, and, and these guys contribute. I mean, it's not just me. It's funny when I, when I go on Facebook and I see all these posts always, Dirk, 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 can you do this? Can you help me, Dirk, can you do this? Here's my code, I have a problem, Dirk, Dirk, Dirk. They, People react as if it's just me. At some, it's <laughs> actually funny, at some point I asked uh, in our Facebook group, we have a, the Plugin Alliance audio files group. That, um, that's our little uh, private group. And it's uh, just over 20,000 people in there. And I asked those guys, what do you think how big or small is plugin lines and brainworks? How many people? What's our revenue? And then what's your perception of uh, of the company? And we had everything from uh, there were guys who were serious, and they said, "Well, it's probably you and your wife." And I said, "Sure. I mean, I, I program all these plugins, and then I create a website, and I'm on. <laughs> I'm also do all the support for all these customers. And I mean, it, it's kind of crazy. We had other guys estimating that we're probably 500 people. And I said, well, that's, I don't know of any plugin company that's actually 500 people. So um, that's maybe a bit, uh, it just yeah. shows that people don't have a, a clear idea of, of what it is, but uh, definitely not me and my wife. That that would be funny. No, of course. And on that note, um, I should, I should probably let you go. Um, I don't, I don't want to, <laughs> I, because <laughs> it, it sounds like there was there was food or something involved so. yeah I'm, I'm actually ha i mean i think right now the situation that we're all in is especially hard for for women if their husband is working full-time and and it's funny my job almost doesn't change yeah i don't go to the office every day and i don't meet with a lot of people but i'm still on my computer i'm doing my emails i'm doing sales campaigns and contractual work or whatever mm -hmm. and all the all the women in, in uh, around the globe probably have the kids right for 24 7 pretty much and so i'm actually trying to to help a little bit so i'm taking two or three hours off now and we're probably doing a little bike ride in the forest we live right next to a forest here social distancing and everything but um yeah so it's it's probably good to, to have a break and then i continue my work in the evening when my little guy he's, he's five when he's sleeping so and that's how we all have to adopt a little bit to the to the crazy times right now. Yeah, hope, hopefully that will um, start to uh, go away. But uh, you know, on the small silver linings, I got to meet you, um, <laughs> and we'd love to stay in contact and all that sort of stuff. So, but uh, wonderful for you to give up your time. Thank you so much for for talking. Yeah, thank you. All again. right, thank but you so much, and yeah, talk soon. Bye bye. Talk soon. Bye.